this is thinking about thinking in bets. I'm going to go to your home state of Ohio. I'm going to go with Paris Johnson Jr. here. Mm-hmm. We I, I drew these graphs for you. I didn't make them for the show because I'm not I don't like the the how the way they look. But we we saw with Skaronsky on the left side of the distribution as far as his arm length. Paris Johnson's on the right side. He had 36.13 length arm, six foot six, one, 313. He played for Ohio State, you know, when he had he had 165 true pass sets. So again, pass protection plays were no help, no, you know, no play action, none of that. He gave up eight pressures, which is 157th in college football. So you have a guy not as productive or efficient in college as Skaronsky, but obviously with the size and just the way he moves, you look at him at the at, at the combine and pro day, a very, very flashy athlete here. Flashy athlete, you know, an athlete that everyone thinks that they can continue to build with, of course moving around, sliding easily, of course, long arms, as you mentioned. I mean, you know, again, everyone's looking for that guy that they truly believe that they can build build with for, for contract after contract. I, the interesting thing about him is I really want to see how, how it plays out with him. Where is he right now projected to go? I mean, he's in that teen, early teens, right? Yeah. 12, 13, 14, 15. But I'm curious to see what team is going to be hot on him right now. If Skaronsky goes earlier, who's who's the next team jumping in? Are they yeah. jumping in on him? Or are they jumping in on on Broderick Jones? Yeah, and that's really interesting because when you think about the way in which the draft works, right? So Jim Nagy, who runs the, the Senior Bowl, tweeted out today that he's like, you guys are all too wide receiver crazy. The um, You know, I only see one or two guys going in the first round. And, you know, when that happens, obviously, there's going to be a run on on players in the trenches. And, you know, players in the trenches, generally speaking, are high. I mean, last year, it was like the first 10 picks were all offensive and defensive line, with the exception of one, a corner. Um, I, I do think that these guys, Joe, I think, I think you're looking as early as eight for the first offensive lineman. And then, you know, I think with Johnson or Broderick Jones, you know, you're looking – uh, you know, or Darnell Wright or one of these other guys, you're looking at maybe at like 12 or so. It really also depends upon the quarterbacks. And I think, you know, there's some steam in the marketplace that we're not going to see your your favorite prospect, Anthony Richardson, go at three or four. We might see him slide a little bit, in which case that might be uh, a place where we could see a, a, a offensive lineman. I, I think it's eight to 12 is where you're going to see these two gentlemen go. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's an interesting, that's an interesting, uh, place placement, I think. Yeah. I, I just, if, if there's that run on pass rushers that we think that's going to happen along with the quarterbacks, you know, maybe pushes them a little bit further. I mean, there's a couple corners that, that we feel are going to be popping in there, maybe two, maybe three, you never know. I agree with Jim Nagy. I'm not, I'm not real bullish on the receivers, not to get off in another, another position, but. I really do believe that quarterback. I believe that corner. I believe, you know, again, the O lineman will wait just a little bit because I think there's going to be some really solid rushers in that mix at the beginning mm-hmm. of the of the drafts uh, up in the top ten. So I, I'm just I'm going to be interested to see how it all plays out there on the offensive line side because yeah. there's some other offensive linemen we won't get to today, as Jim has alluded to that are solid. How high they go, you know, that's always tough, right? You, you, you know, when you're in that 20 to 25 to 30 range, you're, you're a lot more comfortable as a general manager pulling someone off the board and you're thinking, okay, let's continue to grow with them. When you start pulling a no lineman in the top 10, eight to 12 to 15, there's a lot more pressure on you, man. You, you are so much more in a spot where you're thinking, I know my owner is going to be breathing down my neck on this one. Well, and, and I wanted to bring up this example because, I, I think it, you know, we've seen two guys taken kind of in that top five range that ended up being like the first one was Tony Mandarich in 1989, where he was just an absolute like physical athletic freak and it just doesn't work for him right away. Um, and then there was another one, and this is more recent is Robert Gallery, who ran a four nine. Like he was the first offensive lineman we we saw run a four nine in like the modern era, right? And like he had all this stuff and he eventually was a starting caliber guard for the Raiders, but no one cared because he was like the second or third pick in the draft. And to your point about that, like, let's turn the clock back to you. 
you had and and when you talk about the back end of the first round by the way the hit rate is one in three right basically recently one one out of every three of those guys more or less gets the the fifth year option exercise it's a it's it's desolate at this point right it's hard but you went and got you know mcgarry and lindstrom in the back half of the first round and i think the saddest part of course is that when you were the general manager they weren't particular they weren't playing well right because of all the stuff you talk about with offensive line where they it takes them a while to get going and you need to be in a good situation and not to say that your situation was bad in atlanta but now you know with arthur there they're in a situation to take full advantage of the offensive line too and and, and their athleticism and their ma- ma- maturation 